on Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you also to everyone who came out yesterday. Um, we were down in DC for a day of action where we were speaking out against the banning of books in education, banning um, or, and racial justice issues within education. So thank you so much. It was a, a great time together. Really appreciate it. And you know, it's, I think fitting for us thinking about things like that where we're speaking out, we're talking about words, that's our theme for today, and also our actions, um, that's very much the theme of James, and we're going to focus uh, on that letter again today, um, in particular the issue of speech, what we say, how we use our words. Um, but it's a very practical book, and last week we were looking at chapter two, it was talking about favoritism and, and bias and prejudice, especially uh, towards the rich versus the poor. Um, um, it gets into some details around economics and, and wealth and that kind of stuff. And um, obviously money is something that's very important to us as a church community. We don't really talk about money a great deal, um, but you can probably tell that we're about to, right? Because I just said that. <laughs> so um, for the next few weeks, we're just going to focus on our finances as a community. Our, um, you know, 90% of our funds come from the donations of people like you and me to, to the cause here. Um, and so Melanie is going to come up and share with us a little bit about some of her story with giving, um, and then I'll share a few words after that. So, Melly, let's welcome Melly up to the front here. Good morning. It's so good to see you all. Small notes, you'll be glad to see. <clears throat> no tome. Um, I am Melanie Griffin, and I've been at Cedar Ridge about almost 30 years now, which is like unbelievable. I can't believe where the time has gone. But uh, shortly after I started here, I joined a, a new small group that was called 30-something. It was uh, sort of a little play on a TV show at the time, which some of you might remember. And there was a guy there speaking uh, named Stephen Shields, who was our treasurer of Cedar Ridge at the time. I see some of you nodding. And he was talking about money, as he often did, being our treasurer. And I was really impressed with the way he talked about it and thought about it. He, he talked about money as a gift from God, and it was no different than any other gift from God, it, that we would give it back, that we should have a generous heart and, around money. And he really normalized talking about money, which I appreciated. I thought that was refreshing. But he was also talking about tithing, which was a new concept to me. I didn't grow up in a church family and didn't know much about offering, and I kind of throw my five or ten bucks in the basket on Sunday, and I had given my offering. Plus, he was talking about whether you should tithe, which is giving 10% of your income to the church, on your gross or your net income. And I was like, whoa, these people are out there. If I joined a cult, you know, 10%, is he crazy? But I was, uh, I was new to following Jesus, and I was really interested in different practices and disciplines that could help me do that, so I thought I would try it, and uh, so I did. So I started tithing, and I feel like it really changed me. It, it kind of detached me from my money, you know, or thinking about money changed my priorities and my values and how I, how I thought about it, and it gave me a, a certain freedom uh, from money to be have a different priority, you know, um, seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else comes. And so that was new for me and, and exciting. And I also, the other thing I remember is um, for the first time having a kind of a, and the only word I can think of is a maternal sense about this community, about, about you all, just a kind of a, a, a collective responsibility, a nurturing feeling, uh, um, because I was giving. It was a very joyful, joyful thing to be a part of something bigger. And then, some years later, I'd been tithing, uh, all along we started uh, our fundraising campaign to buy a property and build this church. And it was called a place called home uh, campaign. And But I sort of, I liked it. I thought it was nice we were doing that, but it felt separate from me because I tithed. So it, this didn't apply to me. I didn't have to give to this campaign. And then one time I remember um, we were raising a million dollars, that was our goal. And I remember a guy getting up to speak on Sunday and I don't, I don't know who he was, he was a skinny guy with a blonde ponytail is all I remember. And he was talking about his thought process in giving to this campaign. And he and his wife were struggling financially. He was like a house painter or a lawnmower or something. And, and uh, so 
he said, you know, that they prayed and they really thought about it. Our, our tagline was not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And so he was talking about that they had decided to give $15 a month. And this was going to be a hardship on them. And I thought, boy, they're sacrificing a lot more than I am for this vision and dream that we have. And so, so I upped my giving and I gave to that campaign. And that, again, that felt really good and, um, and right, you know. And then when Matthew asked me if I would share about giving, the first thing that came to mind was watermelons, which is probably true for all of you. But I, after we bought the property, uh, we had a big celebration here, a big uh, camp out and a 24-hour vigil and a square dance, and it was, it was really fun. And, and my, my role was to bring watermelons, so I brought like 30 watermelons, I think, and I brought my young adult nephew with me to help unload them. And I remember unloading them out by the old farmhouse and turning around and looking at the property, and of course the building wasn't there then, and just saying to him, Jeff, I own this this is mine. And not experiencing that like in a selfish grasping kind of way, but this is ours. You know, we've done something here none of us could have done alone. And uh, like even our solar farm, you look at what we're doing here. It's because of all of us making our little sacrifice, whatever that is, and I felt such a sense of belonging and family and, again, that sort of nurturing, caring feeling. And so that's what giving really means to me is that, is that sense of all being in it together and doing something much greater than we could ever do on our own. So I just want to thank you for everything that you've done over the years and everything you give. It's not just about money. It's, you know, your time and your talents and your prayers. And, and so thank you for letting me share that. Am I on again, John? Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Melanie. So, um, you know, we'll be talking a little bit about this over the next few weeks. Um, we'll just leave that there, but just, you know, let's all um, remember we're a community together. And I, I love that expression. Uh, it's not about equal amounts, it's about equal sacrifice. We're all just uh, doing what each of us can, and that's what's important. So we, we're in the book of James. We, um, what are we now? Week four, I think, in this letter. Um, we've um, explored, sort of gone through it pretty systematically up to this point. We're going to do um, a little bit more today in chapter three, the beginning of chapter three. Um, you may remember we, the, the title for this series is um, a wiser way to live. And we're looking at this notion in James of divine wisdom, enlightenment, if you think, if you, if you like, um, and how that can help integrate us, how that can help align us so that what's on the inside matches up with what's out on the outside. What we believe matches how we live. What we um, say matches what we do. And so there's this way in which wisdom, as, in, as James describes it, brings us into alignment, brings us in, into a more integrated whole life. And we're going to explore that theme a little bit more today um, around how we speak, how we use words. Um, and uh, we left off um, or we, uh, in chapter 1, right at the end of chapter 1, it says this, um, those who con consider themselves religious and yet who do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Pretty strong statement. And then it goes on to say, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look, out after to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So what James is saying here is, perhaps, that if you really want to know what someone's like, if you really want to see reality about someone, if we want to see the reality of ourselves, then... Look at how we treat people who are less fortunate than us and look at how we speak to people or how we use our words. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's what James is saying. There's other important things in the world for sure, but what James is saying, okay, you think you're religious, how do you speak? How do you treat people? And, and last week we talked about how we treat people, particularly around issues of prejudice and bias, and that was the whole of chapter two. Um, so, you know, at the end of chapter one, he addresses those two issues. And then, we, and then it digs into the second one in chapter 2. And now in chapter 3, the author turns their attention to the issue of speech. So let's, actually, I've, I've got printed off a copy here. Let's read through the passage for this week. Um, just 12 verses today. Um, but we can make them last a long time. 
<laughs> Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Okay, so that's um, this week's passage. So what we're going to do, as we have been doing, is break this down a little bit so we can sort of, um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, look into the details of the passage in a, in a more helpful way. Um, and I've broken it down into four sections here, just a, you know, two or three verses each. Um, our words reflect our universal brokenness, so this is a problem, a challenge for all of us. Um, our words empower us, they give us some control. Um, but also, on the other hand, our words control us. Um, and then um, our words reveal our duplicity. This is the sort of the big issue in James of, the, of our life kind of not matching up. You know, what we believe and what we, how we act, what we say and what we do, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a duplicity to that that James is addressing and saying, come on, we've got to, we've got to line up our lives. Okay, let's, let's look at the first section then. So, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. <laughs> Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So we'll just leave that up there for a minute. So first of all, this is a challenge for everybody, right? That's the, the word all there, right? We're, we, we all struggle with speech. And I think to some degree, this passage kind of makes sense. You know, some, uh, some parts of James, you have to really kind of think it through and, and maybe even look at some of the meaning of the original language and that kind of stuff to make sense of it. Whereas this one is, I think, it, it kind of makes sense to us. We have all been on the receiving end of really negative words, right? Um, we've all used negative words. We've all said stuff that, oh, why did I say that? And, um, so, uh, you know, it just comes out. Um, we've had situations where people have spoken really helpfully and positively to us. Um, I can think of situations in my own life where I've really opened up with someone else and kind of let them in on some of my own struggles and weaknesses and that kind of thing. And, and I, I can think of two specific examples where one person responded with a very encouraging, helpful, affirming, um, positive response. And that, that I remember that. I, you know, I told a story about that once, so I won't repeat it, but um, that, that was kind of life-changing, very significant. Um, I can think of another instance where I, I was talking about my own brokenness and my own struggles in life, and somebody basically said something very condemning, like, you're never going to get over that. There's something wrong with you. You know, that kind of language. And I, I have to, I continue to this day to have to forget that or not live like that's a reality, right? Because those words were, in, were incredibly powerful. Now, I know I've done the same to other people, right? So I think we all have some of those experiences, so we know this is a big deal. Now, what James is saying right off the bat there is, not only is it a big deal for everybody, but um, really what James is saying is, I am the only, I'm the, perhaps the most likely person in the room right now to be hypocritical, right? As a teacher, as a leader. There's a warning here to leaders. 
And that is, I think, the warning for, for someone like me is, and I, I, and I guess it's a warning for, for everybody here, that if you, if I, my words don't match my actions, or if I'm all nice and kind and cuddly up here, well, not cuddly, but, you know, up, up front, but then in real life, in everyday life, I speak meanly, callously, inconsiderately, disrespectfully, and act like that, then you should not trust me. Right? If it, I mean, now, don't expect me to be perfect, because um, I'm not, and we're going to talk a little bit about perfection um, in, in a moment, um, what it is and what it isn't. But um, there's a strong challenge here to leaders. And I think that's, that, so I, you know, I, I want to really hear that loud and clear, because I'm, I'm speaking at the moment, I'm using words at the moment, and I think religious leaders in particular, their words can be um, damaging and hurtful, or they can be encouraging and uplifting. Doesn't mean they're they're not challenging, but they're healthy and positive, and, and leading people towards something that's life giving, rather than something that's hell giving. And we'll talk a little bit about hell in a moment as well. Okay, so, but then there's this really, I think, categorical statement at the end, or quite astonishing statement: anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Well, as I say, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, able to keep their whole body in check. In other words, I think what the author is saying here is, look, if you can control your tongue, you've mastered everything. You've got your whole being, your whole body in, in check, if you've, you've actually got control of your, of your tongue. And, it, and the author describes that as perfection. Okay, so it's a, I think we get the enormity of the situation here, or the importance of the situation. Let's look at the next, um, the next section. Um, our words empower us. So this is verse 3 to 5. Let's look at that. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. So here the author is saying, look, words are small things. Speech is a small thing in one sense. The tongue is small in terms of the rest of the body. But it has incredible power. We can exercise incredible power, incredible control through what we say. And the implication here is kind of positive, I think. You know, um, uh, managing and, and channeling the, the power of a horse, that sort of suggests to me a kind of internal, we have this internal strength, internal power um, that our words can, can unleash in a, in a positive way. Um, when you think about the rudder of a ship, um, he's using a, 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 a sea analogy there, you know, wind and waves and sailing, um, in a similar way to the, how the author did in the first chapter, um, talking about trials as storms and waves and winds that are coming at us. So you, I think this, whereas the, the, the bridle, the bit and bridle analogy is more about internal strength, maybe this wind and storms or wind and waves and sailing and the rudder, that metaphor is more about how we deal with circumstances that come at us and how we can, we can um, uh, control our circumstances or, or leverage our circumstances and deal with circumstances through the power of our words. But then there's this kind of more sinister close to this section about consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And now we're sort of, it's not explicit, but now we're getting more into the sort of potential negativity of this power. We're empowered not just, or our power and control isn't just to um, speak positive, life-giving words, but also to speak deathly words, words that are destructive. I, I, you know, we don't need reminding, really. We are, for, we are very fortunate in this part of the country that we haven't experienced forest fires like uh, we, many all over the world have been experiencing, and in Canada particularly at the moment. But we kind of experienced some of that, right, with the, the smog and the smoke um, this week. You don't think of forest fires as being um, positive. And in fact, they, they're kind of out of control. We're talking about words empowering us and giving us control but somehow this analogy now is breaking into something that's out of control. And that kind of takes us on to this next section. Our words control us. So we, our words give us control, give us power, but actually our words begin to control us. It's the, the other way around. In this section, here's what the author says. The tongue also is a fire. So continuing the, this fire analogy. A world of evil among the parts of the body. 
It corrupts the whole body. Very categorical statement. Sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Now let's, can we just go back to the beginning of that, um, that section, um, uh, Greg? That's great. Let's just leave that part up there. So the tongue is, is a fire. So there's this, this raging fire analogy. And I think the implication here is that our words, our speech, begins to control us, begins to dominate us. You know, the, the, if you like, it's, we, the more we speak negatively, critically, um, you know, what, however that is, I mean, there's all sorts of ways of doing that. The more we do that, um, the more we begin to live out that narrative, right? The more we, it, it becomes just familiar to us. It may be words we say about ourselves, words we say about somebody else. Um, words we exchange with somebody else about somebody else and it begins to take over it begins to become our reality and uh, and, it, and there's something sinister about it it's something that it, it, you know we're not in control actually in the way that we we think we, we should be or could be and it that expression it corrupts the whole body it sets the whole course of one's life on fire in other words it's progressively destructive and it's kind of it's like a cycle it's like it's it's holistic in that that narrative begins to control our words and then our words begin to control that narrative and it's it just goes on and on and it's like a fire that's raging it just get, it, it gets it's, we're just giving oxygen to it and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger um, and and the inference here is the author is saying is that comes from hell that like the fire itself is set on fire by hell now hell's an interesting word and we, we talk about it occasionally here um, the word in the Greek there in the original language is the word Gehenna which was a real place it was a dump outside the walls of Jerusalem in that day where all the trash all the decaying matter dead animals um, uh, rubbish would all be taken and burned. It also had a lot of historical significance for the people of Israel because it was also a, a site where in their dark, some of their darkest days uh, there, there, there was human sacrifice. So it's got very dark, sinister connotations but it was a real thing. It was where all the, all the um, rubbish was burned. And G this is one of Jesus' favorite words for what we translate as hell. So when Jesus talks about hell, he talks about Hades, the Greek underworld, um, or Gehenna, this actual dump outside Jerusalem. Um, the inference here, I think, is not about you know some the, the fiery hell with the devil with a, with a pitchfork and all the rest of it. This is about the darkness that's in a, in all of us, the sort of decaying areas of our lives, the areas of our lives that we're not paying attention to, um, the areas of our lives that are kind of perishing and 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 dying, and are, are dark. And that's that, those areas of our lives, and again, remember, James is talking about alignment, bring, not, not, um, not being double-minded, as we'll see in a moment, this duplicity, but saying those areas of our lives really matter, and if we don't address them, if, we, if, if, if we're not consistent and, and coherent in, in the way we live out our lives, but have these hidden away areas, or areas, well, I'm not going to go there, because that's just one of my weaknesses, it's, you know, if we don't, if we live, if that's how we live, then we're just going to decay, and that that sparks the fire. That's the fire that can affect how we act, how we behave, how we speak, in particular. Very, it, you know, this is a very serious challenge, I think, from James. Um, let's go to the last section. Um, yeah. So our words reveal our duplicity. So this is this issue of alignment. Um, okay. Let's look at these few verses. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Same mouth can praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now again, I'm not going to say too much about this because I think it's kind of obvious, right? How do people, what do people taste when we speak? Do they taste fresh water, life-giving words, or do they taste bitterness, salt water? And uh, the author of James here uses a, a sort of classic metaphor of fruit. You know, a, a fig tree is not going to produce olives. And again, thinking about the, the taste metaphor, I have, a, I have a good friend back in England who used to love to play tricks on people where 
he would make what looked like chocolate truffles dusted in beautiful cocoa powder. But actually, they were goat cheese on the inside. And so he'd go around serving these things, and you'd pick it up, even if you like goat cheese. If you're thinking truffle, and you put goat cheese in your mouth, you just, you gag, right? Try that on uh, next, next time you have people over for dinner. Um, but the point, the point here is, um, what do we taste like? You know, what is people's experience of us? And what, you, know, you know somebody by how they speak. Our words reveal who we really are. Again, uh, you know, I, it's so easy to stand up here and be kind of nice. I hope you find me reasonably nice. But what about real life? What about when we're off our guard? What about when we're feeling threatened? What about when we're in conflict? What about when we're not feeling very secure? What about when we feel like we're losing this argument badly? Those are the, those are the times when we see who we really are, right? And, and, and James is using this analogy of fruit just as Jesus did. And we'll, we'll, Jesus talks, said, for instance, by people's fruit, you'll know them, know who they really are. It doesn't matter how religious they are. What's their life like? And in the discussion questions today, there's a few scriptures there um, quoting Jesus and also quoting the Apostle Paul um, that sort of relate to this particular passage. So a plug for the discussion questions there. Okay, that's the message over. You know that's not true, right? (laughs) So we've looked at that whole section. What I want to do just in this last few minutes is look at, we're talking about words today. So I want to look at three words in, that we've looked at so far in the book of James. We're not going to jump ahead at all because we've still got uh, some to come in the next two weeks. But I want to look at three words that I think get at this issue of alignment and integration of our lives. Because that, James is saying again, wisdom, divine wisdom, divine enlightenment, Christ consciousness, if you like, this higher consciousness, is what aligns our life so that we do what we say, we practice what we preach, we hear a challenge and we live it out. Our faith matches our works. Our works are lived out because of what's going on on, on, on the inside. There's integration, authenticity. And these three words get at this issue, I think. And the, the words are double-mindedness, perfection, and salvation. So let's look at these a little bit. So the first one, double-mindedness. Um, we heard this in the first chapter, first few verses. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Okay, so this is the wisdom issue. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe or trust and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. There's that analogy we were talking about earlier. Uh, or a metaphor, should I say. Um, that person should not expect to, see, to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all, the, all they do. That word, double-minded, in the Greek it's dipsikos, or like dipsychos, if you like, so double-minded. Um, and it's the only time it's used in the Christian scriptures. It's a unique word to James. There's many others that are unique in the Greek to this particular, particular letter. So that double-mindedness is this issue. It's the problem, if you like. It's like, okay, yeah, I want to live a good life, but I also want to do this. I want to be kind, but I also want to be selfish. You know, it's this... Um, um, duplicity that we all struggle with, right? We, 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 all of us struggle with that. It's not, it's not um, uh, unique to any one of us. We, it, it, we all have areas of lives that need to change. We all have a- areas of hypocrisy in our lives where we don't kind of line up. And last week we talked about, I think it was last week, or, yeah, it was last week, we talked about duplicity in the sense of um, we pick and choose what kind of laws or uh, um, uh, Challenges. What, what parts of the way of Jesus we follow. So um, the challenge last week was, well, Jesus says love your neighbor, but also love your enemies. So if you just love your neighbor, you can choose to, I'm a loving person because I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to love the people I like and then ignore how I love my enemies. Um, that's, that's, James is saying that's problematic. Or if you, if you, if you have, say you have faith, but you don't live it out, that duplicity is problematic. That double-mindedness is problematic. If you, if you hear stuff and then don't do it, you, know, you hear the challenge and think that's right and then don't go and do it, that's problematic. That's double-mindedness. That's duplicity. Okay, so, th- so really double-mindedness in James, and, and we'll, there's, double-mindedness is used again next week when, when we look at it. That's the nature of the challenge. Let's go back to our words. Um, perfection. So per- perfection is... In James, I would maintain, is 
is how it's the product of resolving that duplicity. It's, a, it's the product of alignment. Now, the word perfection in the Greek is teleos. And um, it actually gets translated all kinds of different ways because it has a very holistic meaning. It, 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 we think of perfection, of course, as something that's perfect, sort of faultless, um, immaculate, perhaps would be words we'd use for that. Can't be improved upon. But that's not really the sense of this word teleos, or the Hebrew word that's um, related to it, tamim, in the Hebrew. So if you translate, as they did, the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they did that in about the third century before Jesus, something called the Septuagint, um, the word for perfect, tamim, in the, in the Hebrew is translated teleos. Right? And tamim and teleos mean whole, integrated, um, inclusive, um, resolved, complete. That, that's the sense of perfection. It's, it's, it has a sense of wholeness to it, integration to it, and it also does, it doesn't have the same static connotation that I think we have in the English, which is something's perfect or it's not. In, in, the, in the Hebrew sense and portrayed in the Greek and, and teleos, it has this sense of, of progress, of movement, of resolution and evolution e even. Now let's look at a few examples of this in the book of James. So um, we looked at this um, earlier today, right? We've read this a couple of times already. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Perfect teleos. In other words, kind of that's the goal. That's the goal. Um, so this is the sense of somebody who's integrated enough that they've got, they've got whole... Um, control over their body. They've got, they, they, they have discipline and, and a surrenderedness that means they're in a state of perfection, according to James. Okay, let's look at some other examples, though, because this word is used elsewhere in James. We've seen it already in the last few weeks many times. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not show change like shifting shadows. So here, here's perfection is... It's, it's divine, right? It's, so this teleos, this perfect gift, which is wisdom, right? Coming down from above, that's, that's what the gift uh, the author is talking about is. So this wisdom is able to align us. It's able to perfect us. It's able to complete us. It's able to make us whole. It helps us live this integrated life. Um, other examples of it. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Again, from chapter 1. Let perseverance, teleos, its work. So that word finish there is teleos, and so that you may be mature. That's teleos in the Greek. So the, the word is used twice, and complete, not lacking anything. So there's this sense of maturity. It's, it's maturing. It's evolving. We're, we're, we're growing. It has a sense of movement about it. Um, and interestingly that, you know, the, talking about perseverance in this way, that, um, you know, you don't get the sense it's like persevere in your perfection, but rather, because it's like, well, no, because you're not perfect yet, but rather, so perfection is to do with perseverance. It's about, by persevering, by not giving up, that's how we evolve, that's how we become more complete, that's how we become more integrated, that's how we become more whole as human beings, more healthy. Um, let's think about this elsewhere. Um, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So, not forgetting about what you've heard, but doing it. This integration of hearing and doing is, comes through the perfect law. We talked about that last week, okay? Not religious law, but really the way of Jesus. Love your enemies and love your neighbor. Um, uh, treat others as you would have them treat you. This, this way of life that Jesus has talked about is lived out as we integrate um, what we hear and what we do. As we integrate what we believe and how we practice that. As we integrate um, what's on the inside and what's on the outside. Now Jesus used this word teleos as well. Um, and let's look at a, a couple of passages here because I think this is really significant. And very much, I think, what the author of James is getting at, talking about perfection. Here's Jesus. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, 
Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, teleos, therefore, as your heavenly Father is teleos. And, you know, we could look at that with the English translation with a more Western European modern day concept of perfection and think, oh my gosh, that's so, how, God is perfect, whatever that means, and we've got to be like that. You know, it's, how, it's unattainable. It feels kind of unattainable. Unless we think about the use of that word, what that word really means. Because here is Jesus talking about integration, right? He said, don't say, I love my neighbor. You can't just love your neighbor and hate your enemy. No, you have to love everybody. Why? Because God loves everybody. And so God is teleos. God is integrated. God is whole. God is inclusive, if you like. There's a, there's a, um, a sense of inclusion in this word. Interestingly, um, the, Jesus spoke Aramaic, right? Jesus would have said these words in Aramaic. We had the big challenges we talked about before. Is that Jesus speaks in Aramaic. People remember his words, write it down in Greek. And then we, um, you know, several thousand years later, translate it into English. So, you know, there's a bit of a challenge there. But if we think about Jesus, he would have used the word, the Aramaic word, gemira. And that word gemira means enlightened or understanding or wise. Um, that's the, that would be the, the implications here. And, and so, so what Jesus is saying is, okay, God is all wise. God is understanding. God is enlightenment. God is ultimate pure loving consciousness and you can be like that you can grow into that by integrating your lives by being inclusive in your thinking and your actions by by aligning and there's a sense i think of of kind of resolution to this perfection not struggle well there's struggle in it but it's not like you better be perfect there's like just align and integrate and we get a great example of this, I think, in another um, a few words of Jesus, when this rich man, this very powerful, wealthy person, comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I've followed all the commandments. I, I'm, a, I'm a devout religious person, but how do I have the kind of life that you're giving, this life eternal, this real life that you're talking about? And Jesus says to him, if you want to be perfect, to Laos, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So Jesus, I think, is saying, align. If you want to be aligned, if you want to be integrated, which is how you live this life that you're talking about, that you're wanting, just align. And for that guy, that person, that rich young man, it was, he's holding on to something which is preventing him from aligning. And that's material wealth. That's where his security is. That's where his dependency is. And Jesus is saying, let it go. Just let it go so you can, so you can align. Now, um, it's interesting. Again, I, I think of this as a, as a beautiful thing, not a pressure thing, because the fact that that young, rich person came to Jesus saying, I'm really religious. I'm doing everything right. But I want the life that you've, you've got means my religion's not working for me. He's missing something. He's intention. It's like, I want what you have. And it says at the end of it that he goes away very sad um, because he, he can't let go. He can't let go of his material wealth. And, and you get this sense that all this tension, he just couldn't align. He couldn't teleos. He couldn't reconcile, resolve. And that's the challenge of James. Now let's look at another word, which is a good classic religious word, salvation. Um, that's, again, not a word we talk about that much. The word in the Greek there is so-so. And it can mean to rescue. You know, like somebody's drowning, you go out and so-so them. You go and rescue them. But it also can mean to heal. And in a similar way, perhaps, to teleos, it can mean to reconcile, to make whole. You could see how that, that could be part of that meaning as well, right? And I think we tend to lose that side of the meaning when we talk about religion. But we'll 
we'll look at a couple of incidences of this word in, in James first. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. Do you remember we talked about that? That's, that's a, an, an, another unusual word there. Awful translation, I think. Moral filth. Just sounds, but uh, King James Version calls it superfluous naughtiness. Do you remember from, from a few weeks ago? Much better, much better description. But I think the point being here, the stuff that contaminates us, right? And the evil that is so pre- prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. So h- accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Okay, so don't just listen. Don't just hear. Do. Align. And that alignment in James is called salvation, right? Here James is calling it salvation. So in other words, we've got this notion of the problem is double-mindedness, duplicity, kind of hypocrisy, if you like. The goal is alignment. And that alignment is actually what salvation is all about. When we talk about salvation, it's talking about this way of life. Um, There's another example in James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith and has no deeds? Can such faith save them? So there's alignment again. There's, There's alignment. Now, this term salvation, I think, has come to mean something like this. We're all sinful. We're all bad. Every one of us. I mean, I'd check. Yes, I'd agree with that. You know, totally agree with that. And so God doesn't kind of like that, maybe doesn't like us. And salvation is the way in which um, we get saved from hell because bad people go to hell when they die and good people go to heaven. And salvation is all about getting saved from hell and going to heaven. Um, and so we read a verse like um, in, in right at the beginning of, of Matthew's gospel, um, the angel Gabriel announces, she will give birth to a son and you ought to give him the name Jesus, which means savior um, in, in the Hebrew origin of that, because he will save his people from their sins. So we could interpret that passage as what, you know, we're getting saved, rescued from the consequences of, of our sins, which are hell. And then we have sort of that, added to that is this notion that actually salvation is, happens because Jesus dies. So, so there's a problem with, with sin, and Jesus is killed really by God. God sends Jesus to die, um, kind of dying instead of us. And because of that, we go to heaven. We don't go to hell. And so that's, what, that's how Jesus is the Savior. Now, I, that's, I, I'm, I'm in no way trying to say that can't possibly be true. It's just, I've got, speaking purely personally here, it just doesn't really work for me. Because that would be like me, my son misbehaving. He's, I've got two sons in their 20s, so you know, they can misbehave a bit. Or just not, just being mean, being horrible, being this, that, and the other. And me saying to them, you know, you, you need to stop being like that. It's not, it's not right, and I, I'm going to have to disassociate myself from you. Um, but, it, but to keep, keep our relationship open, I'm going to go and take my dog and kill it. In, instead of instead of you and inflict this pain on something else in, in, instead of and I think you would think I was crazy I, if, if I did that but but in a way we're sort of saying that that's what God does rather than what would stop God just saying I forgive you right I forgive you and so maybe we as we think of even the very nature of our, our religion in some respects have we have we interpret this as rescuing salvation is rescuing rather than healing and making whole could it be that when the angel announces this Jesus is going to save save his people from their sins it's Jesus is going to show us a different way to the to the way of Gehenna the way of evil the, the way of decay and perishing Jesus is going to help us align and live this life that he's talking about and 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 wouldn't because I know we're going back to you know that interaction with my son I Killing my dog might, in some legal way, get, get my son off the hook, but does it heal him? Does it mean that that behavior or that dif- difficulty, that darkness, that, that dysfunction is then redeemed and sorted out and, and, and made whole? It doesn't necessarily mean that. 
It just means that something is going to happen in the future when, when he dies and he, he goes to the good place rather than to the bad place. Maybe this notion of so-so, salvation, being healing, could help us reinterpret some of the words of Jesus and reinterpret what Jesus was all about. Maybe Jesus came to help us align. Um, let's look at another example of this and, and we will wrap up on this. Here's, here's perhaps we talked about this a few weeks ago. This is probably the, the most famous passage in the Bible that talks about salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Again, that's been classically interpreted as believe in Jesus, believe who Jesus was, believe that Jesus died to save you from your sins and, and you will go to heaven. But, and, and if you don't, you'll perish, you'll go to hell. But we talked a few weeks ago about the fact that perishing, perishing is not something God does to you. Perishing is not some, some kind of destination that is punishment for living a bad life. Perishing is just what we're all doing anyway. Right? It's that Gehenna, it's that decaying, it, it, we're all in decay, we're all, there's parts of our life that are a rotten, stinking mess. And Jesus is saying, I came to, so that you don't have to perish, that you're, you could be alive, you could be a new creation, you could, be, you, you could be experience life itself, real, beautiful, full, whole, aligned, complete life. And that's increasingly, for me personally, again, I'm just showing my own personal how I see salvation. Salvation is about what happens to us in the here and now. That's what Jesus came for. That's what Jesus is here for. That's what, Je that's, that's what Jesus is doing. Healing us, making us whole, um, align, helping us align. And this, and this um, gift of wisdom, this enlightenment, this higher consciousness, this Christ consciousness, helps us live that kind of aligned life like Jesus. Because Jesus is so inspiring. Because the way he lives matches his words. He does what he says. He loves indiscriminately, inclusively, the righteous and the unrighteous, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I, that's what I want. I, I, want, I want some of that. I, I don't just want to know I'm going to go to heaven because I believe the right set of things. You know, Jesus is offering so much more than that. And so um, we'll... we'll um, wrap up now, we'll get, we'll, uh, band, if you could come up, that would be great, we're going to go into communion. Um, let's look, put that first scripture, one of the first scriptures we looked at, because the big question I think is, is how do we do this? You know, how do we experience this alignment? And there's two issues, I think, here. Ask and trust. Ask and trust. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. So, we could paraphrase that. If you lack this alignment, if you lack this um, higher consciousness that helps you align, that helps you integrate, just ask. In other words, just open yourselves to God. Be intentional about opening yourself. Be intentional about letting that consciousness settle in and resonate within you. Give yourself to that. And in, in the... Um, discussion questions this week, there's a, there's a practice that we can, a very short practice that we can do each day to kind of open ourselves to that consciousness, to adopt that consciousness intentionally, rather than just going out into all the wind and waves of life. Um, and then, and when you ask, believe, don't doubt. In other words, trust. So when we, when we take on this higher consciousness, let's trust that actually it is worth loving your enemies because Jesus said it was worth it and Jesus lived it. That it is worth being loving when we feel defensive. It is worth being open even when we feel we're being attacked. It is worth treating others not as they deserve to be treated but as we would want to be treated and we break the cycle of selfishness and, and violence. We trust that way of Jesus. We trust that it's the, it, it, it's the way. So we, so we ask and we trust. And so we've got a few moments here together before we end where we could just reflect on that, I think. Just open our minds, our hearts, our beings to that wisdom. 
um, and then sink into trust and, and, and commit to living that way. We're going to, we have communion, which is a, an ancient um, a ritual that just helps us remember Jesus and, and, and embrace the presence of Christ in the here and now. Gluten-free crackers and fruit juice you can come up to the front here and, and take those or at the table in the middle. We have other stations around the room where you can pray, light a candle, you can write prayers out or just pray quietly. Um, there's, there's stations um, for racial justice at the front here with a new reflection, a new meditation, if you want to check that out. Um, and we also have our finance stations where you can uh, make a financial gift. Let's just take this time as, as we need it. Uh, the band will, will uh, sing a song as well um, to ask and trust. Please come forward for communion when you're ready.